part of it. Um, so there's a lot of resources we could use just to read the letter. Um, this, for instance, there's a few things, um, and I can I can share all these with you. This is kind of interesting. It's a this is a, a very scholarly article that was written I think in the 30s, um, and it's a critical edition of 39 um, of the Arabic manuscript, the Hebrew manuscript. Um, you know, comparing them, trying to get at you know what's what's exactly the right manuscript. Um, obviously, we don't have the I don't think we have the originals, you know, although it, it's not so crazy because sometimes in the Cairo Geniza, you do find, a, you know, like I think we have like I think we we have maybe a volume of the Mishnah Torah that's signed by Maimonides. I mean, we have those things in the Cairo Geniza because it goes back, Cairo Synagogue goes back to 822. Um, but um, these are from manuscripts in the medieval period that uh, both copies of the Arabic text and the Hebrew text it was written in Arabic, was translated by Ibn Tibbon, who was the Rambam's translator into Hebrew for his Arabic material. Um, and it was translated during the Rambam's life. Um, then I did find this article. Um, I don't think I forwarded it to you, but there's two things. One is there's a, a book, um, which I could forward. Um, it's, I have it as a... Uh, uh, translated by Fred Rosner on uh, the whole book is on um, is on this letter and you can see the um, table of contents he's got an introduction he's got the treatise itself <laughs> um, and then a little bit about the debate um, and I'm thinking what we maybe will work from is um, the this article, which I can forward to you. Um, this was written in 1981. Um, this was it, it. This is, I think, the first translation into English of Maimonides' letter on resurrection, and um, it's not a full translation. Uh, it's uh, but it's um, it's it's pretty full, and um, so he has an introduction, and then he translates um most uh most of the paragraphs it's the the letters about 40 paragraphs he translates most of the paragraphs and um most of each paragraph so maybe this is what we'll work from for right now i'll forward this to you on email um so that you can look at it and uh you know the things to think about are how do we read this in light of everything else that we've seen in the rambam's books uh regarding physical resurrection um so uh you know what we saw basically was the rambam um certainly believes in the soul certainly believes in what he calls olam haba the world to come and that reward and and punishment are in are in the are in olam haba on a soul level or spiritual um now, the idea of physical resurrection obviously is something that goes very far back in Judaism. The Rambam, as we saw, does list it as one of the 13 principal beliefs, but it's the last one uh, in his list of 13 principles, and um, he doesn't seem to really explain it. Um, it, it. There's a few reasons why the Rambam might have trouble with physical resurrection at the time of the Messiah. Um, number one, uh, it, it may be an issue with the way that he conceives of miracles, that uh, he does believe in miracles, but miracles, um, if they go on for a long time, then they really need to be part of the system of creation and the laws of nature. Um, the, um, it, it also, I think the Ramam has trouble with the idea of um, uh, you know, reward and punishment being physical, yeah, even though it would be a kind of messianic era, um, you know, that he spends quite a bit of time fighting against one of the branches of Islam, the Kalam, you know, who think that, that you know, the reward, um, the ultimate reward is physical, which he does not believe. So what does he do with the resurrection of the dead? Okay, so we'll we'll see. Now, this letter, of course, was written after all of those. This letter was written, I think, just a couple of years before he died. Um, and uh, what we want to basically judge is: is this a you know, is this an apologetic letter in which he's just trying to 
you know, cover himself because people are accusing him of not believing in physical resurrection? Um, is it, uh, you know, what does he really believe? Um, that, and I, I think, and especially in light of everything else he writes. So paragraph one, uh, it's not imp improbable that one might, and, and after this, I'll send it to you and you can read it and we can discuss it. I don't have to read through it all. Um, but uh, this is sort of interesting. He's, he says, it's not improbable one might intend to explain the meaning of a particular premise in clear and simple language, striving to relieve any doubts. Um, and nevertheless, the feeble-minded will understand from these same words the opposite of one meant to, what one meant to convey, right? Now, it's obviously, he's talking about himself, and he's talking about, right, what he's basically saying is, you know, in my other books, I wrote something, and you have concluded the opposite. Such a thing, he says, actually occurs with God. Um, Moshe wanted to convey God's commandments that there's only one God. Uh, in order that people will, you know, not believe in more than one God. And, but what did the Christians do with that? They took the verse, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And they interpreted it to mean three, uh, our God, the Lord, and, uh, right, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem. It does say Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Achad. God is our God, God is one. So it's a little bit confusing. It is a little bit confusing because it does have more than one praise for God there. Um, and so Christians apparently said, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem is three. Um, and so he says, you know, you can't expect me to be better than God who writes the Torah and is misunderstood. Uh, if this can occur with respect to God, how much more so a human being? Um, we, we, you know, we set out, he's talking here about the Mishnah Torah, his book of Jewish law, to compile the, the laws of the Torah and explain its rules. Our aim was you know, he says my aim was 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 only to serve God. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to undermine anything. I wasn't trying to seek reward or or honor. I'm trying to clarify the Torah. And he does say that in his introduction to the God to the to the Mishnah Torah, to his book of Jewish law. That his point is he wants to make one book so that people can understand the whole Torah. Um, in our view, one should understand the words of the Torah sages of blessed memory who preceded us, it seems that we simplified and rendered in intelligible, abstruse and difficult subjects, right? The point of the Mishnah Torah is to simplify things. And, and the Rambam did believe that the Mishnah Torah is enough. Now, is that just having the written Torah and that the entire oral tradition is, is, is his Mishnah Torah? He does say in the introduction of Mishnah Torah, that's all you need. All you need for it to understand Judaism is the written Torah and his book of, of Jewish law because it summarizes essentially the whole Talmud. Um, and um, now obviously people took, took pe people disagreed with that. But um, he says, you know, I put together all these sources. We knew at least we we're accomplishing something. If our work failed to clarify or simplify to any greater extent, um, then we have earned divine reward for our intention. God desires that if we, if, if our work failed to clarify or simplify to any greater extent than the work of our predecessors, then we have earned divine reward only for our intention. That's, not everything's perfect these days. When we learned of those who profess falsehood and doubt, but imagine themselves to be the wise men of Israel, when in fact they're the most ignorant, um, we realized that it would be necessary for us to explain in our halakhic work principles of religion by stating them simply, simply rather than by demonstrating their validity. Notice the Ramam says the Mishnah Torah is not a book that tries to give you the reasons why. And that's true. And it also doesn't give you sources. All it does is tell you the halacha, the law. So he says, I've simplified everything. You know, you, you can't have everything. You can't have things simplified and summarized, you know, the spark notes of Judaism and also have depth. Since bringing evidence for these roots requires aptitude in many sciences of which Talmudists know nothing, as we explained in the Moray Nebuchim, you preferred that at least fundamental truth should be accepted by the masses. So he says, I, I'm not trying to make philosophical arguments in, the, in, the, in, in my book of Jewish law. I'm just trying to give you the, the bottom line. Um, and so, you, you know, what's he saying? He's saying, you may have misunderstood something because of my, because of the way that I wrote it. Uh, I wrote it in a, in a summary sort of way. Uh, in the introduction to our Paris and Mishnayis, his commentary on the Mishnah, which is his earliest book, uh, we talked about certain principles of belief with respect to prophecy in the oral tradition. There he's referring to what we looked at, um, which is his introduction to Parakhelek, to the last chapter of Sanhedrin, 
in which he lays out the 13 principles of faith, but he has an introduction to that that we saw. Right? In Parachelek, we elucidated the root principles relating to the beginning and the end, the unity of God, the world to come. And you remember, he listed out, you know, the, the, he talked about the, the Garden of Eden, he talked about the world to come, he talked about um, the Messianic era. We did this in our great compendium, the Mishnah Torah, whose value is recognized, you know, it's a good book. And um, for those who understand the method of the compendium and appreciate the extent to which collected sources were scattered, have it been arranged? You know, he says, saying not everything could be perfect. Uh, we cited all the religious and Talmudic principles of the scholars and the Gaonim. And um, we tried to order it. We tried to put it in order. All of this should be guilt upon religious principle. It should be built upon religious principles. They not cast the knowledge of God behind them, rather direct the most fervent effort that which will lead them to perfection and bring near their creator. He says, my goal was to bring people close to God, not to that, not to that to which the masses attribute perfection. Included among those roots upon which we remarked is the world to come. We discussed at length the truth of the world to come, cited evidence concerning it from scripture and from the teaching of the sages of blessed memory, interpreted that which is suitable for men of wisdom to interpret, right? So he says, I put stress upon the world to come. In Chelek, that is his commentary on the mission that we looked at, we explained the reason that we discussed the world to come, but not the resurrection of the dead. We said that we observed people discussing only resurrection, asking such questions as whether the dead will rise up naked or clothed, right? So here he's arguing that it's true. He, he gave uh, short attention to the resurrection of the dead in Perak um, let's take a quick look at that. And then we did it from that Amazon book. And uh, you'll remember that in the last part of his introduction to the 13 principles of faith, um, he had gone through uh, all these ideas that we talk about. Um, the Garden of Eden, Gehinom, the resurrection of the dead. Right? And he had said is one of the cardinal doctrines of the Torah. One who does not believe it has no religion. This reward will only be for the righteous, as is shown by the statement in Bereshit Rabbah. Indeed, uh, as the stage is taught, the wicked are called dead even in their lives. The righteous are called living even in their death. And know that man must die and become dissolved in his component parts, right? So that's where he had sort of hedged. He had said, he had talked about the resurrection of the dead, but he also very clearly believes that the body dies and decomposes um, and what he talks about most in terms of reward and punishment is the world to come, the world of souls. Um, he talks about the days of the Messiah, but the days of the Messiah for him are not supernatural. They are natural, and they're just a time when there's going to be peace, and it will be easier to study Torah and to do good deeds, which ultimately will bring one to the, um, to the world to come. And uh, in his list of 13 principles, he certainly talks about reward and punishment. Um, and then all the way, right? All He talks about the days in the Messiah in which he thinks that's a natural process. And the 13th principle is the resurrection of the dead. We've already explained this, right? That's, just wanted to go back to those who haven't been here. Um, Right, so here he says, in Chelek, we explain the reason that we discussed the world to come. That's Chelek, what we just looked at, um, but not the resurrection of the dead. Right, why? We said that we observed people discussing only resurrection, asking such you know, silly questions about it. Um, and that he, did, he had said that there. However, the world to come was completely neglected. Right, The Rambam thinks the world to come is the point, is the more important point. Um, moreover, we explained uh, that while the resurrection of the dead is one of the tenets of the Torah, it is not the final end. 
Rather, the final end of life is the world to come. Ah, so here, he still disagrees with those who think that the resurrection of the dead is the final reward. It's not. What the Ram is going to propose here is that the resurrection of the dead exists, but for a very short time, and, and it's not the ultimate reward. The purpose of all this was to explain that some consider to be a serious difficulty, namely while the Torah refers to reward and punishment in this world, makes no explicit reference to reward and punishment in the world to come. Explain the words of the Torah as the ancient sages interpreted them for us. Torah means to say, right, you have the concept of the messianic era in the books of the prophets, but you do not have the world to come. And so he's saying, I focused on the world to come because for two reasons. Number one, people don't understand it because it's not there in the written Torah. Um, and number, But number two, he says, that is the final reward, is the world to come, not the resurrection of the dead. Now, here, though, the purpose of this letter is to argue that he does believe in the physical resurrection of them. Okay, so we'll continue with paragraph eight. I'll, I'll forward this uh, to you so you can look at it also on your own. Okay, we'll uh, continue with this uh, tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.